Hi folks, welcome back. I wanted to share a little bit about um, some changes I've made to the mock events application since we were in lab last uh, last week. Let me uh, let me share my screen with you and let's see. It looks like uh, I'm gonna if I show my face, I'm gonna end up blocking half the screen. So I'm actually just gonna turn my face off and and just talk. So uh, this is the application. It basically works the same way it did when we were working on it. Um, so you can see I can still filter. So if I uh, type some characters here, uh, it only shows the events that, that have those characters in them, uh, in the description, I should say. Um, the sorting still works the same way. So I can sort descending or sort ascending order. And uh, and if I click click here, it creates new events. And the event always says the same thing, hello. Uh, but it puts in the current time. Let's see, it puts in the current time. This is 4.31. Uh, so yeah, 16.31.47, 16.31.45. You'll notice I added seconds so that I could tell the difference between events that were within seconds of one another. So I didn't have to wait a minute to, to make new events. I have added these delete buttons. I'll show you how that works here in a minute um, along the right hand side. And you'll notice that it's updating uh, much more nicely. I don't having to click, I'm not having to reload the page or anything for that to, for that to happen. So um, there's some improvements that I want to describe to you guys. The other thing I want to point out is I've got the, this is the google.com Firebase uh, dashboard sort of here and you can see that as I add events they're showing right up here um, what you haven't seen yet and the biggest change I made was I remember in the first video I said that uh, we were just going to use the light version of Firebase and uh, and I got the darn thing to work but um, it was a little annoying because in order to get the screen to update nicely, I needed to have something that I could trigger to update the um, when I added or deleted uh, elements from the array. I needed to be able to update the screen automatically. And I, I, I realized that when we get full editing in there where you can edit events on the fly, um, you're going to need to be able to detect when something's been edited and trigger an update. and it could be painful. Um, on the other hand, if you if you use the full blown Firebase database, it has an ability, an observer pattern implementation or a publish subscribe implementation where you can basically subscribe to updates. It's called on snapshot, and every time a change happens in the database that would affect the results of a query that you perform, it automatically re delivers the new data uh, for that query. So let me show you how that works. If I actually, you can see it here. If I uh, pick a particular guy here and I say hello again and save it, notice it updated. It updated the data in the application. Um, so if I say now, this is my cool event. It updates the the uh, user interface automatically. So, and I'll, and if I add a, a new document, I give it an ID, I give it a description. This is totally new. And then I go ahead and give it a start then, start with a timestamp. <clears throat> and we'll just make it now. And, oops, uh, I didn't do that right. I gave it a, uh, I didn't give it an end. And of course, my application is not smart enough to realize that uh, the data isn't correct and it it dies a horrible death. Okay, so I've got another timestamp there. Okay, let's refresh this guy. There we go. So this is totally new and, uh, and there you got it. Okay, let me, uh, okay. So how does this work? Um, Let's go back and look at the uh, app.tsx. Let me bump up the font size just a little bit here. 
so you have a better chance of being able to see. And, uh, okay, so uh, as far as the main application goes, it still has the filter box, it still has the event table, but notice the event table now only, it doesn't, it's not as complicated as it used to be because of the subscription business. I don't, I no longer have to set in, send in functions to uh, trigger these updates. I just send in the current events, I send in the filter string, I send in the sort order, which is used to determine how to sort the guys. And I set in the set sort order because these controls are in the event table. And so they need to have access to that set sort order function in order to be able to set it. Okay. Uh, you might argue actually that maybe we should just keep sort order at the table level since it doesn't actually affect any of the rest of the application. And in fact, that's a nice refactoring actually. I think I'm gonna do that. So if I just move sort order, that state, <laughs> into the event table, um, component, why not, right? That's what refactoring is about. You, you think about something, you know what, I'm not using sort order in any other component, <clears throat> so maybe I should just... Uh, now, why is it complaining now? Set sort order. Let's get rid of it here too. Okay, there we go. So now we've simplified our application. We're going to move the sort order state and the set sort order into the event table itself. Um, someone might argue that, you know what, filter box should be in that same component. We should just put them all together. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you're right. I don't know, but uh, I'm going to leave it the way it is right now, just because uh, there might be other components that need to know what what the filtering of events is. I don't know. We're we're going to leave that up to the application designer. Oh, that's us. Well, never mind. We're going <clears> to <throat> we're going to not worry about that at the moment. Um, here's the thing: the use effect. It used to call get events, and then it used to fill the events. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm just calling subscribe events and I'm passing in the set events, uh, the set events setter, that state setter function. I'm passing it right into subscribe events. And you'll notice it has an interesting declaration. It's a react.dispatch generic of a react.setaction generic of uh, an array of events. So where did I get that? I got that by just hovering over set events and uh, VS Code told me what the type of the thing was. It's really good at TypeScript. And so I just could copy that. And when I defined the uh, subscription, where's it up here? Subscribe events, I used that as the type of the set events handler. Now this used to be called get events. Now it, I changed the name to set uh, to subscribe events, and the way it works is the following: it um, you call the Firestore database and you tell it that you want to uh, create a snapshot handler for updates to the results of a query. So what I'm going to do is I, I call the events collection. We had this before in get events. <clears throat> I, uh, I'm going to make a query based on the events collection. And the query, uh, it starts with the events collection, but you could add additional constraints on it. You could say, I want to look only at events greater than a certain age. I only want to see events that have certain characters in the description. You could use the filter events dialog to say, just get events that have this property. Don't pull all the events down. So you could actually make that an adjustment to the query, to the database. Um, here's this, the magic, the on snapshot function. So on snapshot, it takes a query um, and it uh, returns the data. So it actually, it, it, re it returns this thing called a query snapshot, which then you can 
execute for each on and go through all the data in the query snapshot. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I console log out fetching data. I create an empty list of events. I go, for each, L, each document in the query result, I'm going to grab the data and I'm going to push the data onto the events list. This is a lot like get, the get events method that we had before, except that and it's actually going to call set events itself. So I passed in set events as an argument to the subscribe events. And, and it is going to um, call set events itself. Now, the other thing that's sneaky here is on snapshot returns a function which can be used to unsubscribe from the snapshot. And it turns out uh, use effect also returns a function that can be called to, to undo the effect. So I'm going to take this unsubscribe function and then I'm going to return a function that just calls unsubscribe. That's what I'm returning to use effect. And so use effect will automatically unsubscribe whenever I uh, am done with uh, the application. Basically, whenever the application mounts, it will call use effect. Whenever it unmounts, it's going to call the function returned by use effect, which in this case is unsubscribe. Okay, so that's a big change subscribe events instead of get events. Um, then the other things that we did in lab are still there. Post event is still there. I'm still creating an event. Um, actually, we're passing in an event. I'm converting it to a Firebase uh, event, which shows up in the database. All that really means is I copy the description over. I copy the timestamp over and convert it from a date to a timestamp. I take the end, convert it from a date object into a timestamp. Then I add the document to the collection and um, I return the document reference. We're not doing anything with that document reference at the moment, um, but the reference, the document ID becomes the event ID. So we're using that ID to keep track of the, the details of the document that we can use it later to delete it. So I need that document reference in the meantime in order to set the event ID that I just added to the events collection. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, delete event. So delete event. I just get a delete I, uh, an event ID. I get the database. I grab a document reference, and then I call delete doc from that document reference, and then I say delete it. <laughs> um, here's the filter box. I haven't changed that. That's the same as it was before. Filter by name, sort by description. Uh, event table has only changed in the sense that I got rid of some things, but we, we're now keeping the sorted, the sort order in the event table. Um, oh, the delete buttons now. Uh, okay. Here are handle descending click, handle ascending click. Here's our handle post click. Those were all there in lab. Um, there's our post event. That was there in lab. Then um, this is new, handle delete. So I'm getting an object ID and I'm calling delete event. That's all there is to it. The tricky bit is I've got to build the user interface correctly. So every row now, it shows the description. It shows the start and end date. And then I added an extra element to the table, which uh, where I call on click. But notice that uh, I've got the event ID. I'm um, calling handle delete with that event ID. So this is how handle delete actually gets called. So these delete buttons actually work. So if I go and delete a few of these hellos, you can see they're getting deleted in the database correctly. Okay. Um, is that it? I guess one thing else that occurred to me, I think uh, I said something a minute ago that I believe is really not quite right. I'm calling handle delete. That's calling uh, delete event, um, which let's see, if I go back up here to delete event. Uh, 
what is it? Display date, subscribe event, post event, delete event. Here it is. And it's calling delete doc. Um, I am passing the event string. The event ID is coming from, um, oh, what did I just do? Okay. It's coming from the user interface. Um, I actually don't need to do this because the event that's getting posted is not in the list. This event, this actually doesn't do anything. Let me get rid of that. It did before. So before I refactored and changed to uh, on snapshot, it was necessary. But really now it isn't because, um, let's just confirm that. Yeah, because my when I subscribe to the events, I'm getting the events in the on uh, on snapshot method, and the ID is getting set here from the document ID. So I no longer need to worry about copying the ID over. In fact, I could just return just return that doc reference just like that. Uh, is that right? No, not return equals silly person, return a way. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you look at post event, uh, where's post event? Post events getting called in the table handler. Post event. Um, ah, okay, I see why. I see now why I wanted it. Uh, it's, it's getting the ID. It's posting the ID in, in a console log. But that's really coming from the doc ref, so that's okay. This, this should still work. In fact, let's check. Let's check and make sure it still works. I'm going to go ahead and uh, inspect. And let's post. Yep. It says success, and then it has the document ID. Let's actually put a colon and a space here so it looks a little better. And then we'll post again. There we go, success, colon, space, and then the object ID. It's getting that from the doc ref. So when you call post event up here, let's find it again. Post event, it's awaiting the add doc function, which returns the document reference. That document reference has an ID, and that's what's getting posted to the console log. Okay, very good. So uh, that's all fun, and, and it, it produces a much nicer user experience. Um, I did a little research on uh, what Firebase is doing here, and it, the, another thing that it does, without you even knowing it, is it's actually caching the local copy of this these updates that you're getting and it's it tells you right away it update it sends you that uh, that snapshot it's going to send that to you right away even though it hasn't fully made the round trip from the database yet it's okay you're going to get that snapshot in fact you can see it when i add if you look at the console log let's see i think this shows um So if I click, yes, it's it says fetching update. That means it's in the it's actually in the on snapshot before I get that document ID. So it's updating you earlier. It's not waiting for the document to be created and then sending you the snapshot. It's sending you the snapshot first. So it's optimizing for you for that user experience. So you don't have to do that on your own. So you don't have to update your events list, for example, proactively in order to give a nice user experience because uh, Firebase is actually doing that for you. Okay, let's see. What else did I want to show you guys? Oh, yes, very important. Um, let's uh, open another terminal window here. And I'm going to, uh, actually, I already have, but let me start it again. So I, I'm running the emulator. So if you install the Firebase emulator, which you can, you can just say uh, npm install dash g Firebase. That will install the Firebase command line tools. You will need a Java implementation to run the emulators, but any sort of recent Java implementation should, should work. 
and then you can just say Firebase emulators start and it will go out and uh, run the emulators. I've already included in the files in the repository, I've already included a firebase.json which uh, declares port numbers for the emulators and which ones are turned on and so on. So uh, that shouldn't that should just work for you, I think. And you can see it looks like it's running. Um, you'll notice that the emulator, like there's a Firestore emulator, it looks just like the real online network, you know, cloud version of the Firestore database, except it's running locally on my computer. And what's cool about that is I can do tests, I can delete data, I can do whatever I want without messing with production data and, uh, and debug my application. So that's what we're going to do. But how do I get, so right now I'm not, I'm looking at the real thing though. I'm not looking at, um, at the emulator, how do I tell my local instance of this application that I want to use the emulator? So the way you do that is you uh, call a special function. In fact, you can see it's, uh, let's see, let me show you right here. At the very beginning, you'll notice it goes out and checks an environment variable, tries to find the name of the emulator host. If there is an emulator host defined in the environment, it uh, splits the host and the port, and it calls connect Firestore emulator, and that's what does it. So if if emulator host is defined, it's gonna it's gonna use the emulator. How do I do that? Well, I've added a file to uh, my local directory called environment.local, and I'm just gonna uncomment this guy, and uh, that is going to uh, define this environment variable, but I do have to restart. I have to redo yarn start. So I'm going to go to this terminal window, hit control C, run yarn start again, and then uh, that should connect to the emulator. Let's see if that works. Boom. Notice there's no data. Notice also it says emulator here. How's it doing that? Well, if you go back to the app and you scroll down, I did make one tiny change. I added emulator host and emulator. So if emulator host is defined, it will put emulator in the user interface so that you know that you're looking at the emulator. Okay, I happen to have the emulator open in a tab here. And so I can start a collection, call it events. I can go ahead and create a description field from emulator. I can add a, I'm, oh darn it, I did it again. I, I meant to um, finish. Okay, we got to fix that. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go ahead and fix this thing so that it doesn't break. <laughs> okay, here are my events. This is bad. Okay, actually, all I have to do, I think, is put a question mark here. Let's try it. Will it reload? Okay, let's delete end. No. Oh, it's it's uh, line 62. Let's look at that. Line 62. Uh-huh. Oh, it's in this for each. It's going and trying to convert these guys to... Um, so let's do the following thing. There's, there's different ways you could do this, right? Um, let's try this. And if it fails, then stop push. Okay. Uh, 
There we go. And get that to it. 62. Okay, so now if I add end, make it a timestamp, there it gets it. If I get rid of start, it doesn't crash. Okay, nice. Okay. And then it's okay. All right. So if we look in the console log. Let's go ahead and look in the console log. Um, and let's get rid of end. It says error from emulator. Okay, and it's going to tell me what the error is. Let's see. From emulator. Okay. So I ought to be able to figure that out. Let's see. Error, bad data. Okay. Bad data. Console. Uh, I don't know what that is. Okay. Bad data. Okay, there it is. So, but if I fix it, let's go ahead and add a uh, end timestamp. <clears throat> okay, we got it. So, not perfect, but at least it's not going to crash just because I don't have. Uh, let's add another document just for the fun of it. Um, description. Um, new bad record. <clears throat> So what I want to do here, yeah, I hit the plus before I hit the enter. I'm going to say start timestamp, and then I'm going to say end timestamp. Okay, then hit save, boom, and then it's okay. So this is my, anyway, what's the point? The point is, this isn't running on an emulator locally. <clears throat> it's not, um, it's not running in the cloud, so I can make mistakes. I can break things. It's not going to mess with my production application that people are counting on being robust. So it allows me to test things. I could even do some integration testing using the emulators here locally. So that would be that would be all right. Okay. Hope that makes sense. If you have questions, don't forget to ask.